And my title from this morning is Love Builds Up. And we're going to try and get through uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, but as we know in all these things, Paul introduces a subject and then he'll leave it and then he'll come back to it a little bit later in the letter. So we're going to come back to this subject again. But one of the things that really bothers me, one of the things that really gets under my skin is when people show a lack of concern for others. When their actions are selfish. So let me give you some simple examples, things that wind me up on a daily basis. (laughs) There's too many, there is. Litter on the pavements. It's just so, it's so unthoughtful, isn't it? I've got a dog, so when people leave dog mess, it drives me mad, because I pick everything up. People, now this might be you, people who park on the pavement. Dear me, I had a list of, I had a pack of cards that I got from a, a guy I met, and I would slip them under Windscreen wipers that said, pavements off of people. <laughs> but my wife took them off me. <laughs> she felt I was making too many enemies in the street. <laughs> but so the, the serious point in this is that love is critical as people, that we show love and that we do love. And as Christians, it is our calling to love. And that's what we're going to see in this passage It may seem to be about idolatry, but it's actually about how you love people. So, we've arrived at what is the third answer to uh, Paul's answer to one of the Corinthian questions. So, we have this, we have six times in 1 Corinthians, he says, now concerning So when you see that bit now concerning, and it's often at the start of the chapter, Paul is answering a question that they have got. So we're we're up to another now concerning. We've looked at, you know, we said in chapter 7, we saw that now concerning the message you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Chapter 7, 25, it says, now concerning the betrothed. So we looked at that. Uh, last week. In chapter 12, verse 1, it says, now concerning spiritual gifts. And we'll have a similar theme of that when we get there. And it carries on. There's two more in the passage. But the one we're looking at today is chapter 8, verse 1. It says, now concerning food offered to idols. And it would seem that this topic was pretty irrelevant to us, wouldn't you? And yet Paul, and, and, and Paul, but this, Paul discusses it, and so it's important that we look at it. And again, you know, as we say, we could easily skip over this thing. It's not relevant today. We don't have temples where we offer food to idols anymore. But it's our response and our relationship with other people that Paul really picks out in this passage. Uh, and, and that is, and, but the, the, the overall is about idol worship. and and food offered to those idols, but it's actually their treatment of one another. So, let's read the passage, we'll get on to the things. Oh, I forgot to set the timer. Oh dear, never mind. Okay, verse 1, chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and it says, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not know yet, know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. And I, I'll explain this as we go along. Therefore, as to eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, 
Jesus Christ, through whom all things and are and, and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat it, and no better off if we do. But take care, and here's some critical, this is the critical verses. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you that you have knowledge eating in, a, in, a, have, in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? It's Paul's question. And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died, the sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak. You sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Now, it's quite complex words and how it's written and I'll seek to explain that to you hopefully in a way that we can understand and it can help us and apply in our own lives but let me pray for a moment before we start Lord Jesus we thank you for your word we thank you that it illuminates our lives we pray help us to apply it help us to understand it but Lord we over all things Lord we want to be able to love like you loved us. So we pray, help us to understand, but to do it from a position of love and not just to gain more knowledge. We thank you in your precious name. Amen. So what three points I want to quickly make. First, knowledge can puff up, but love builds up. Secondly, there is one God and one Lord. And thirdly, Let's not seek to cause our brothers to stumble or something like that. Can't remember exactly what I wrote, but we'll get there later. So firstly, what do we know? What do you know? Paul asked this a couple of times in this passage. He says, we know that all possess knowledge. We've all got some knowledge, but this is, is in quotes in our, in our Bibles. You might see that in your Bibles, in quotes. And, it, and I think it's... And uh, looking at the commentators, I think it's, it was a slogan that people used. Yeah, we all possess knowledge. And we can eat what we like. And actually, we would say learning and knowledge are a good thing. I would in, in, we, we encourage people in school. We would encourage people to learn. I would encourage you to keep learning and keep gaining knowledge. But there's got to be a purpose in that knowledge. And the purpose in that knowledge is to show love to others. Keep gaining, keep learning new things. Don't, don't feel like you've arrived. Because actually I think when you stop learning, then you become, we possess knowledge. We become into that bracket of those who know and there's those who don't know. Paul repeats in several passages through, he says, because he's talking about knowledge, and he says, do you not know? He says that, doesn't he? Ask that question, I think in chapter 6, four or five times, do you not know that saints will judge the angels? Do you not know the unrighteous will, 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 not, the unrighteous will not inherit the earth? Do you not know your bodies are members of Christ? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? So knowledge is not, Paul is not against knowledge, full stop. We need to know these things. We need to understand them and how we operate. So important. But there's knowledge that leads to pride. And that's what Paul is speaking against. It's pride. It's knowledge that puts, puffs people up and makes them feel superior to other people because they know something. And these other people don't. And they are allowed, they live in a way that puts pressure on people that they think, well, I, I don't really have faith for that. Or we're free to do what we want. Because pride, what does pride lead to? 
Well, it's in a passage that pride leads to lovelessness. If you're proud about what you know, it's not loving. It lacks love. And our hearts, and God's heart for us, is that we're loving people. That we do things out of love. Now, we, we, we all say this, and I, and I say it again. We, we can't just correct people and say, this is what the Bible says. Doesn't help. Doesn't help. If you're trying to correct someone, this is what the Bible says. If you're trying to encourage them, we want to build people up. The idea is you build them up, not just crash them down. Now, we do need to correct people, but we have to do it in a loving way. We have to do it carefully, not just because you know something. Over the years of leading, I've met with people a lot. And, and there's, there's people I've met that you can, I, can, I feel intimidated by because they know a lot of stuff. And as a pastor of a church, everyone assumes that you know everything. I, I know, apparently I know everything and I can do everything. Let me just pop that bubble now. I do not know everything. And I cannot do everything. I can do a lot, and I'm very good, I admit. <laughs> oh, dear. Now I've sinned. But I am not. I can't do it all. And I don't know. And I've met with people who have read an awful lot more of me. They've done theology degrees, and they say, and I think, I not a clue. So that was my best policy in that case, is just to be silent. <laughs> Do not speak. But you can find, I can find with these people, some people want to keep learning for their own benefit. People study and study and study, and you think, why are you studying? Why are you doing that? What's the purpose of you studying all those books? Because I like reading, because they like reading books. And you think, well, great, what are you going to do with what you've learned from reading those books? Nothing. I'm going to read another book. Now, I'm not against books. I like books, and I believe we should read. But actually, if there's no purpose for reading that book. Now, we can read books for pleasure. That's okay. But actually, there has to be a purpose in our learning. And it's to love people, to build people up. I, I want to learn. I want to read so that I can teach I, I and, and you know, and, and it's, I was, you, you, you can question, I question my motives all the time. And I was challenged, I was listening to Francis Chan um, just yesterday, and, uh, and he's, he, he asked those questions, you know, wh why, do you, why do we spend so much time in preparation? And uh, the question is, well, because I, uh, because I want to please God. Yeah, it's a good answer. I want to please God. Secondly, because I love the people. And you think, mm, okay. Partly, but a lot of the time, it's because I want people to like me. You want people to think you know stuff. And that came as a bit of a shock to me. Because I think my motivation is purely out of love. But it isn't. Well, our motives are so mixed all the time. We've got to be really careful. And we need to be accountable to one another on that. To be accountable. Why do we spend so much time doing this? Is it so I feel like I've got knowledge that I can win an argument? Or is it because I love people and I want you to understand who you are. Now predominantly I, I want it to be and I hope it is because I love people and I want you to understand how God loves you and who you are in God and that's why we're preaching through this material because it's not easy. But it's about your identity in God. It's about my identity in God and all the time we speak we're speaking from that personal point of view. I'm not saying 
well, I'm speaking here because I know stuff and you need to know it. No, I'm speaking here because I need to learn it as well. I need to understand it too. I need to understand. Well, that's why I've never seen it this way. I need to understand what I'm supposed to be preaching, which is Galatians 4 verse 9. John Piper says, you have knowledge which loves people and loves God because you are known by God. Oh, no, we, we, we want to know stuff because we're known. We're known by God so we know stuff and we want to love because we're known by God. It takes away what we're doing. It's not enough to declare that you know God. It's not enough. It's not enough to declare that you know God and you know stuff about God. You are, God has to know you. It's a two-way relationship. It's not just about what you know. Let me give you an example. I can tell you that I know Jurgen Klopp. I know him. I know exactly what he looks like. I even know what he does. I know what he sounds like. For those who don't know, he's the manager of Liverpool Football Club. I know him. I know him. I can declare I know Jurgen Klopp. And you know what? Even I could declare here in public that I love him. <laughs> I love him. He is the best manager Liverpool have got at the moment. <laughs> and I love him. But do you know what? He doesn't know me. I mean, it'd be amazing, wouldn't it, in the, in the, in, if he did his press conference yesterday and he said, I just want to shout out to Dave Frodsham, my mate in the Wirral. <laughs> I don't, I know him, but he doesn't know me. So that's not knowledge, I don't know him. And actually, that's the same with our relationship with God. We, God needs to know us. It's not just enough of saying, I know God and I know about God, and I know who he is, I know what he no, we don't know what he looks like. You know what he's like. But if he doesn't know you, you are not known. You don't know him at all because he doesn't know you. So you, we have to have that understanding of knowing. That knowing that's good is a knowing that's through God. Galatians 4, 9 says, But now that you have come to know God, this is what I should have been saying, or rather to be known by God, now you have come to know God. So we can say, I've come to know God. And what Paul would say, well, rather you have been known by God. If your testimony is true, if you are a Christian, then God knows you. And that's the knowledge we want. Living for God, loving God, loving others. Love is the result of knowing God. not just spouting off what you know. It's, it's loving God. There's a response to knowing God and it's loving Him. And it's also loving others. If you don't love like God loves, you don't know God. God doesn't know you. God first loved us he demonstrated it by sending his son to live on earth, to live and die in love. His example enables us to love. We can love because of that love. That's the only way. 1 John 4 is all about this. If you read, want to read that passage after, it's about, it's, it gives us our confidence and our assurance that we have, that we have, if we have confessed our sin and Jesus is Lord, then love is the result. If you've confessed your sin and you're saying Jesus is Lord and there's no love, well, I would question whether you have confessed your sin and made Jesus your Lord. You say you're just going through the motions. It's just like me saying, I know Jurgen Klopp. 
would make no difference to my life unless he knows me. Because it's about relationship. This is what continue. We, we, if we go back to John, 1 John 4, because he, he says in 1 John 4 verse 19, we love because he first loved us. But if we jump back to verse 7, it says, beloved, beloved, sorry, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Because that's, that's the summary of what I'm saying. If you know God and God knows you, you'll love and you'll have love for your fellow man. You'll become less selfish. Because there's a motivation. And a motivation comes from knowing God and God knowing you. And he's changing you. And when God says something, it changes. Amen. Because God chooses you. You know why? You chose, why God chose you? He didn't choose you because you came to him. No, you came to him because he chose you. Because he spoke to you. Because he revealed himself to you. Because we can't come to God unless he reveals himself. We can try. And actually, we talk about people seeking after God. And I think there is a desire for seeking. But actually, that seeking after God comes from a seed that's been planted inside by guess who? God. Yes. If knowledge is not the result or doesn't result in building up other people and loving other people, it's not worth having. Andrew Wilson says, knowing things can make our egos and heads bigger. Loving people can make our brothers and sisters bigger. That's what we want to do. Okay. Point two, one God and one Lord. What do we know? Here comes the question again. What do we know? We know, Paul says, and he declares two things that the Corinthians declare. He says, we know that idols have no real existence. A wooden idol doesn't have any power. It's, it's just a wooden. It's not fashioned. It has no power. It has no real existence of itself. Now, we'll come back to the holding of idols later because they do have power over people. But it's not the wooden thing that has power. It's what happens inside people that has power. And then he says, secondly, he says, there is one God, the true God. There's no God but one. Therefore, the conclusion from the Corinthians is, well, what's the problem with eating food that's been offered to an idol? What's the problem? What's the problem with doing that? Because they're not real. In Acts 19, we see there was a riot in Ephesus, stirred up by a silversmith, because, and this is what he says, he says, this is what the silversmith says, and he says, you, and you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but almost all of Asia, this Paul, this Paul that we're reading from, has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that God, God's made with hands are not God's. What gods have you got that are made with hands? Gods have you got that you are made in your mind? Gods that are from your thoughts, not God. What gods have you got? There's not a danger in these gods, but there's a danger behind these gods. There's a danger in the way people worship them. There's a danger in, you know, whether these gods have, uh, 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 whether there's demons behind the gods. And we're not going to get into that today. Because there's also man's influence on those things. 
And th this silversmith in Acts, it was about greed. He was frightened for his business. It's about money. And often that is a God for many people. And this is what Paul says. What's the true God like? He says, yeah, in verse 6, yeah, for, for, there, for us there is one God, the Father from whom all things, from whom are all things, we've got to read this right, from wh whom are all things and for whom we exist. So God the Father, from, from all things come from Him. All things come from Him. And for whom... So the Father is from whom everything comes and for whom we exist. So that's the Father. And it says, and there's one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things. And through whom we exist. So if this one God, this statement about one God and one Lord, we come from God and for God. And we can come to God through Christ. And he made creation through him. If you look at John chapter 1, you'll see that. That he was there in the beginning. And all things were made through him. Andrew Wilson comments again. He says, everything comes from the Father and it comes through Christ. We live for the Father and we live through Christ. Do you understand that's knowledge that you need to know? That's knowledge that helps us love other people. Final point. Don't put a stumbling block in front of your brother. It says in verse 7, it's, however, he says, not all know. You can't assume that everybody knows the truth that you know. You can't assume that everyone knows that idols have no power, no existence. You can't assume that because not everyone does know. And people have had different lifestyles. And he says that because of the life they previously lived, what life have you previously lived? Do you know about everyone in this room and what life they previously lived? Do you know that? Because you could declare something that's a real problem for somebody else. Because you don't, we don't know. So by declaring our freedom and the life that we've had, we can put someone else in real turmoil. Or we can turn them away from God. The passage is quite strong. It says we might destroy them. Let me give you some examples. Why do you think we don't serve wine? On a Sunday morning, as, as, as much as I'd want to. Because I know some knowledge that I have. Is there's some here who that's a problem for. And why would I put a pr uh, something in front of them that would cause them to stumble? So we don't serve it. Now we can give them choice, but actually we just think it's easy. This is, it's all the same. It's still from the grape. We make sure we have grape juice. If we left it long enough, <laughs> it would become wine. We just drink it early. But actually, there's a, there's a point in that, isn't there? There's a point that we don't want someone else to fall because of our freedom. Now, I, I, I've declared before, and I said, well, I, I, I believe that you could drink it, and it wouldn't be a problem. But why, would, why is that? Why, my, that, knowledge, that knowledge of mine is not helpful for my brother who is struggling with that, and it might struggle with it. Now, we know he might not. But why would I put something in front of him that might cause him to stumble? And there's other things that we could do to the way we've lived, the, the things that we've got freedom to do, the life that you've lived. Other people might not have the same, whether it's money, how you dress, where you go, the places that you've been brought up in. We've got so many different cultures that actually there's different cultures that believe different things. And we, we need to be sensitive. It's great hearing Michael again here this morning. You know, Michael, we know, comes from, came from a Muslim background. I'm sure there's certain things from his background that he wants to avoid. 
certain things from his culture, from the culture he grew up in. He thinks, I don't want any part of that anymore. Because that would cause me a problem. Well, we think, well, that's all right, we could do that. That's not a problem. Because we don't have that same background. Do you understand? It's about love and it's about how we love people. Knowledge, we know to possess knowledge so we can be proud from it and say, well, I know that you could eat that and it's fine. Now, Paul says we need to love because love builds up. Love encourages. Love strengthens. The motivation for what we do is love. Now, some of the things we have to say might be hard. And we want to declare truth. But we do it from a position of love. And with a desire to love and to see people grow. Grow in their relationship with God because that's the thing that matters. I don't want to teach. We don't want to teach our kids. And this is one thing we talk about. We don't want to teach our kids just so they know all the Bible stories. So they could do really well in a Bible quiz. That's not why we teach them. We teach them to have a relationship with God, to know God. We want to teach them how to know God. How that, and it's hard, isn't it? You're trying to express it. It's really tricky, but the desire is that we want to teach relationship and about relationship. How important it is. Verse 9, 8 and 9. And there might be other things in your life that cause a problem. But Paul says in verse 9, he says, take care. Take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. And in Romans 14, there's a whole, again, another chapter of this stuff. If your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. There he has clear, isn't it? He encourages us, Paul. He says, pursue what makes for peace. Pursue peace. Pursue what makes for peace. Pursue mutual building. That's Romans 14, verse 19. Now, we can go into the detail of this, but we've not time this morning. But this whole thing of how, whether they ate food, that was sold at a market and they didn't know where it had come from, or whether they saw someone. But the, the, the key point that he has is if, 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 if someone who's a weaker brother sees you eating in one of these temples, or how they were set up was they had like dining rooms, and they would bring their food in, and they would sacrifice it to the God, and they believed that that God would then get rid of all the demons, and they would be eating with the God. Now, what we... From our point of view, you would say, they've just invited the demons in to that meat and meet with you. And actually, if someone sees you doing that, they would struggle with that. People saw me doing things that I had freedom to do. They might struggle. We've got to be careful. We've got to do things with a motivation of love. Be careful how you exercise your freedom. Verse 11, it says that the weak person might be destroyed if they see you operating in a way like that. And then the conclusion for the end. The conclusion of the end, if you, if these things happen, if someone stumbles because of what you have, you're operating in your freedom to do, perhaps eating meat that's been offered to a another God, it says you are sinning against your brother. So there's a sin. You're sinning against your brother. And Paul concludes then, if you're sinning against your brother, you're sinning against Christ. Now, our motivation is not to do that, is it? We don't want to sin against Christ. We don't say, well, this, I know that, this, that these idols have no, no existence. Because though we, no existence some power over people. Not really, but in the way people deal with that. But we're saying they have no existence. So I can eat this food, it's fine. Or I can go to that place, it's fine. Because that doesn't have any power over me anymore. Because I'm dead to it. 
but you're causing your brother to sin because he doesn't understand, because he hasn't got that knowledge. So Paul concludes at the end, he says, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat. At least I make my brother stumble. It's not a verse encouraging vegetarianism, but it's about causing your brother to stumble. If you're doing something that causes someone else to stumble, someone else to go down a path that they didn't want to go, that they didn't understand, and for them it would be a sin. You're sinning against God. We don't want to do that, do we? We don't want to do that. We want to please God. We're here to please God. We're here to please God, love God, and love one another. That's what we've been called to. Is that right? Amen. Okay. be great if we could sing, Burn. There he is. Let me bring a conclusion. Just, just go back through these things. Love, and we're looking for love builds up. Love is a result, not of knowledge, but of knowing God. Love is a result of knowing God, not just knowing about God. There is only one God and Lord, and everything comes from Him, and it comes through Christ. And thirdly, let's live so we don't cause our brothers and our sisters to stumble and to sin, because God loves you all. Let's stand. Paul in the next chapter gives us a, an example of how he lays his rights down and how he lays the things that he could do down because of not wanting others to stumble, wanting to show his love, wanting to build others up. Why are you here this morning? Are you here to gain knowledge? Are you here to know more of God? And in knowing more than God, loving your brothers and sisters. Because that is the result. Lord, we thank you that you came to us in love. You came not to condemn us, but you came to save us. You reached out to us when we were still sinners. And you said, come, I will pay the price that you can't pay so that you can be in a relationship with me so I can know you. My Father can know you. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this truth that sets us free free to love others free to declare God's love thank you Jesus we bless your name